In politics, we usually say a new head of state enjoys a sort of grace period of 100 days. Popular support is still fresh from the campaign, the opposition still doesn't have much ammo against the new administration and there hasn't been enough time for internal disputes to create unsolvable problems for the government. It's the proverbial honeymoon period. But boy, the start of the Jair Bolsonaro administration has been anything but smooth. For starters, the president's chief of staff decided to fire everyone from his office, but then couldn't hire his own guys because he had fired the guys who hired people. Then one of the president's sons was under investigation for money laundering and possible connections to armed militias. Cabinet members have given very controversial statements such as calling Brazilians cannibals. The president spent two weeks in the hospital to undergo surgery, while his VP tried to make himself look more presidential than the actual president. And then, to top it all off, one of Jair Bolsonaro's closest allies was fired after an electoral fraud scheme was uncovered. Oh, and in terms of policymaking, the government wants to give more rights for cops to kill on duty and it plans to completely overhaul the pension system, something that nearly every administration in the past 20 years has tried to do with different degrees of failure. And all of that was in fewer than 50 days. Will the next four years be this crazy? My name is Gustavo Ribeiro, editor-in-chief of the Brazilian Report. This is Explaining Brazil. Ewan Marshall, you followed the latest scandal of the Bolsonaro administration. Yep, I did, as we all have been. First of all, it feels weird to say latest scandal for an administration that was inaugurated just 50 days ago. Yeah, that's right. But it has been, they haven't been wasting any time, let's just say. So what happened to the president's secretary general, or should I say former secretary general, Gustavo Bibiano? Okay, so this scandal begins from a report from newspaper Folha de São Paulo, which uncovered a scheme in which the Social Liberal Party, which is Bolsonaro's political party, they had used dummy candidates to funnel public money, which should have been financing political campaigns. Instead, that money was going to companies connected to the party's leadership. And Bibiano was the party's chairman during that time, during the election, right? Yeah, he was. But importantly, he was only the leader temporarily because the party founder, Luciano Bivar, who Bibiano blames for this whole scandal, he only handed him the reins as the chairman for a few months, which conveniently left Bibiano liable for any of these campaign funding decisions. And is there any precedent for a scheme like this? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a very banal maneuver in Brazilian politics, and actually most parties use it. Folha had a report saying that I believe 14 political parties had suspicions of using dummy candidates throughout the last election. And essentially what the scheme is, is they choose candidates who intentionally have next to no chance of winning, and they hand them a large chunk of the publicly financed electoral fund. Coincidentally, and... I'm making air quotes here while I say this. These candidates are not featured much in advertisement pieces, right? No, they are really no much more than a front just to kind of funnel this money through to these companies which the leaderships of the party have kind of picked themselves and set apart. And the Social Liberal Party in particular is suspected of having misapplied some 400,000 guys throughout the scheme, which was technically under Gustavo Bebiano's watch. So the president fired him right on the spot, right? I mean, given that Bolsonaro promised during the campaign to free Brazil from corruption. Well, not exactly, because for an entire week, Gustavo Bebiano was essentially being chastised in public for the revelation of the scandal. And at first he was trying to say that everything was okay, he said on the 13th of February that he had spoken to the president on three different occasions to kind of smooth things out. During that time, the president was in the hospital, still recovering from a, 
uh, surgery to remove a colostomy bag he has worn after being stabbed uh, during the campaign trail. Yeah, no, that's true. And Carlos Bolsonaro, who had basically been spending all of the time with Jair Bolsonaro in his hospital room, and he's one of the president's sons, and he's popularly known as Jair Bolsonaro's pit bull because of his aggressive way of doing politics and going after any of Bolsonaro's enemies or uh, critics. Nice. Yeah, and he called Gustavo Bebiano on Twitter uh, a liar. He had been spending the whole day with Bolsonaro, and he claimed, no, no, this... This Bebiano did not speak three times to, to my father, never mind the president. And hours later, the president's account actually retweeted this attack. What is interesting for me is that Carlos Bolsonaro manages his dad's social media account. So we don't know if Jair Bolsonaro is retweeting or uh, Carlos Bolsonaro was retweeting himself through his dad's account. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But it's, uh, it's, it's too late for that, I think. I think it's already been said. <laughs> then what? So behind the scenes, after all this scandal starts to really, really heat up, Gustavo Bebiano, he threatens to spill the beans on some compromising information that he might have on Jair Bolsonaro, bearing in mind that he was one of the ones who orchestrated Bolsonaro's entire campaign. So if there was anything fishy there, he definitely had access to it. And some allies of the president started to refer to Gustavo Bibiano as some form of ticking time bomb. He is not a traditional politician. He entered politics with Jair Bolsonaro, right? He's Bolsonaro's number one supporter. He basically dropped everything that he was doing. He had a promising law career. He even uh, owns a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym in Miami, Florida. And he left everything he was doing to kind of devote himself to promoting Jair Bolsonaro and getting him elected president. When you say everything, you mean everything, right? During the campaign, his father died, but Bibiano was next to Jair Bolsonaro. He wasn't by his father's hospital bed. Yeah, but when Bolsonaro was stabbed, he moved from Rio de Janeiro into a Sao Paulo hotel room to stay as close as he could to Jair Bolsonaro. So, you know... He's definitely got his priorities in the right order there. And, and like you said, being in the campaign trail as the president's or candidate at the time, Shadow, if there's anything to be known, Bibiano would be the guy who knows it. Yeah, yeah, that's the case. Uh, we have heard that not only was Bibiano really close to all of the coordination, but that he was actually the one in charge of the accounts of the campaign. So we had many many mentions of the illegal campaign financing during the Bolsonaro uh, campaign, these sorts of allegations of people using WhatsApp messages, companies purchasing uh, packages of WhatsApp messages. Which is 100% illegal. Campaigns cannot get money from companies. Yeah. We uh, have a podcast on that, by the way, if you go back a little bit uh, in October. Yeah, so if, if these allegations are true, then Bibiano knows the details. He knows what happened there. And essentially what happened after that was that Gustavo Bebiano and the president decided to strike a bit of a deal. That Bolsonaro would fire Bebiano, as it was obvious that his place was no longer tenable in the government. And then Bolsonaro would publish on social media a video recorded by the president himself thanking Bebiano for all of his hard work and not mentioning any sort of wrongdoings or blaming him, anything like that. Agradeço ao Sr. Gustavo pelo esforço e empenho quando exerceu a direção nacional do PSL e continua acreditando na sua seriedade e qualidade do seu trabalho. And in exchange, Bibiano would, quote, cool off his head, end quote. But knowing these characters, it would be too easy for things to have ended there. Yeah, that's true. So <laughs> this is fascinating because apparently Bebiano was quite upset that Bolsonaro didn't f completely fulfill his promise in regards to the video because he did record the video and he shared it with the press and his allies throughout WhatsApp and all these sorts of circles. But importantly, he didn't share it on social media. Ah. And that's important because Bolsonaro supporters were lashing at Bibiano on social media, calling for his head and saying that the president should get rid of him as quickly as possible. 
Yeah, and these days the president's Twitter account has really turned into some sort of like official communications channel for Jair Bolsonaro himself. He's got over 3.3 million followers. It's almost as if what he says on Twitter has more weight than what he actually says in public speaking appearances. So if you want the president to kind of clear your name, you basically need to get a, a tweet. Did Bebiano retaliate? Yes, so on Tuesday afternoon, we heard the news that Gustavo Bebiano had leaked some private audio messages, which would suggest that he wasn't actually lying when he said that he had spoken to Jair Bolsonaro three times on February the 13th. And they were published on the website of Veja magazine, which is a weekly magazine in Brazil, under the title, The Audio Clips That Prove the President Was Lying. Ora, querer empurrar essa batata quente desse, desse dinheiro lá para a candidata em Pernambuco para o meu colo, aí não vai dar certo. Meaning the crisis is not over. Not by a long shot. Well, there is this uh, uh, big academic literature on the importance of, you know, the quality of politicians. This is Felipe Campanti, Bloomberg Distinguished Associate Professor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and, you know, how important it is to try to, to sort of attract high quality individuals into, into politics. And I think that's, that's an illustration of like what happens when you don't have that. It's a completely self-inflicted uh, uh, crisis, poorly handled from the beginning. Uh, so you can only imagine what might happen when something where some actual crisis is thrown upon this administration, right? So I think on the one hand, I think it, it, it tells you something really negative about the quality uh, of the decision making in this administration, sort of on the political front. So that's 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 one thing. The downfall of Gustavo Bibiano elevated yet another member of the military to the cabinet. Retired Army General Floriano Peixoto is now the eighth cabinet member coming straight from the barracks. He will be responsible for political negotiations on behalf of the administration, a job that comes with great prestige and proximity to the president. It affects the balance of power in the administration, further empowering the military wing of the administration to a large extent because of that sheer competence angle, right? So, you know, when almost by, by gravitational forces, power ends up uh, in the hands of, of, of people who, who, are, who can get things done kind of in a, in a more uh, basic way. With the arrival of General Peixoto, the military now occupies all but one of the cabinet positions that are housed within the presidential palace. Only the chief of staff is a civilian. And that could have deep impacts on how the government is run from now on. I'm a big believer uh, in the importance of physical proximity, you know, spatial proximity for you know, human decision making. So I think, you know, the fact that these are the people who are on a daily basis interacting with the president and it's, you know, his innermost circle, their views are going to be uh, uh, aired closely and sort of most intensely as a result of that. So just, you know, the, 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 the spatial proximity to power, I think, I think is a big deal. This then interacts with the, the military aspect of it, right? So the military is a very, you know, hierarchical uh, uh, institution. This creates, I think, a dynamic that is very awkward and, and, and a little concerning in that, like we have all these generals at the nervous center of power uh, and the person, you know, above them in the hierarchy is the captain, right? So I, th I think there's a little, there's something awkward uh, 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 in that, which should not be underestimated. During the presidential campaign, many moderates in Brazil warned against voting for Jair Bolsonaro. The former army captain defended the legacy of the military dictatorship that ruled Brazil until 1985 and promised to bring a legion of generals with him to the government. Now, many of these same critics are seeing the generals as the adults in the room. 
Inconvenient actors that, despite a lack of appreciation for democracy's traditional ways, would prevent the federal government from plunging into total chaos. I think that uh, it's normal for a new administration. This is Claudio Couto, a political scientist at Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Brazil's most distinguished think tank, and a columnist at the Brazilian Report. It's normal to bump heads, it's normal to have doubts, even to make some mistakes. But what we see is not only that. We have that, and in addition to, the, addition to this, what we have is a, a government that is a kind of, well, Brancaleone army, to remember the, the, the Italian movie from the 60s, with a, a crazy captain that tried to organize an army of uh, uh, lumps, of uh, prostitutes, of people who don't, don't, don't have anything to do in their lives, and so they, they, they try to join that army. This is what we have today. We have an administration that a total mess, a total confusion, and it's much beyond uh, what would be normal in the beginnings of a new administration. It is ironic that Vice President Hamilton Mourão is seen as a source of moderation within the administration. After all, one and a half years ago, he called for military intervention, and we all know what that means. A full-blown coup d'etat. I don't think that Morão is exactly a moderate, but compared to Bolsonaro, and compared to Bolsonaro family, and to the somewhat crazy people that represent the ideological sector of the administration, well, Morão becomes uh, a more moderate person. He has the capacity to communicate better, uh, he has international experience. All these points uh, are positive traits of Moron compared to Bolsonaro. But, of course, it doesn't mean that Moron is a kind of statesman. In a more conventional administration, we would, ne would never make such a comparison. We do that because Bolsonaro doesn't behave as a president. For now, we are still trying to pick apart the Bibiano fiasco and the many unanswered questions which remain. Why did the president take so long to fire Gustavo Bibiano? Why did he go through the humiliation of recording a video thanking his disgraced cabinet member? Does the former secretary general actually hold anything against the president? Going forward, you know, the perception of vulnerability is already baked in, right? So it's like, look, even if he doesn't say anything this week or the next or, you know, this month or what have you, there is this shadow cast over the administration and who knows what, you know, other people might know and might decide to reveal kind of down the line. So even beyond what there actually is, what people perceive there to be is a big deal. And I think that Pandora box is already open, right? So I think that's that's a big takeaway from this from this crisis. One thing is certain, the soap opera is far from over. If you like this podcast, please rate us on whatever platform you use for listening to podcasts. It helps us a lot. And take a look at our website, it's brazilian.report. Every day we have new content about Brazilian politics, finance and society. We've also got exclusive newsletter services if you want to be briefed about what's going on in Brazil before starting your day. Subscribe now to our free trial and enjoy all of our content for seven days. And it's really free. You don't have to submit any credit card information whatsoever. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at Brazilian Report. That's all for now. See you next week.